Hello, everyone. I'm Peng Yu. I'm a PhD student from the University of Edinburgh. My poster is a near infrared variability survey of young planetary mass objects. Especially, this is the first near infrared variability survey of uh, young T type objects. So, this uh, young planetary mass objects are exoplanet analogs uh, because they are free floating, so it is easier to observe them. And uh, they can also be called as young brown dwarfs. So different from field brown dwarfs, they have a, a lower surface gravity and they're younger. And therefore they have a red color than the field brown dwarfs. And uh, which indicates that there are thicker clouds in their atmospheres. And if the clouds are not homogeneously distributed, we can observe the variability in their brightness. So my theory found that young objects tend to be more variable than uh, field brown dwarfs. And as a function of a spectral type, uh, both field and young objects tend to have a higher variability rate at the LT transition than outside of the LT transition, uh, which we agrees with the scenario that the silicate clouds break up at the LT transition. So if you want to know more about the variability of brown dwarfs, welcome to visit my poster. Uh, hi, I'm Elena Mamonova. I'm from University of Oslo. And in this project, we decided to revisit uh, uh, piece and pot pattern uh, uh, be because uh, now we can acquire a larger sample of well-defined masses. Um, this pattern were, uh, were um, initially spotted in a Kepler mission. Uh, so we decided to include the test planets in our sample. Uh, and um, also we uh, were motivated um, by the, if uh, radii of uh, adjusted planets are similar, so uh, masses and uh, bulk densities could be also similar. It would be, it would be a good indicator about, uh, it would be good indicator that uh, probably uh, internal structure uh, and uh, atmospheric composition would be also similar. But we uh, found that uh, radi of adjacent planet in our sample indeed uh, similar, uh, but uh, uh, this similar in radio planets have uh, different masses and different density it, uh, apparent on this uh, mass density diagram. Also, we looked into uh, systems with similar stellar parameters and spotted um, interesting patterns, uh, some um, of uh, some of systems with uh, cool stars uh, uh, frequently co uh, frequently host um, planets with similar masses and the uh, density of uh, uh, of uh, in, uh, density of planets in the system uh, with uh, low metallicity and old age also could be similar and if you have any questions please uh, meet me by my poster 54 thank you Hi everyone. <clears throat> Hi everyone. I'm Andy Mayo. I am a sixth year or soon to be sixth year grad student at UC Berkeley, working with Courtney Dressing on detecting small planets in a diversity of exoplanet systems. I have a poster up right now about detecting new planets in planetary systems where we've already found one planet already uh, with tests, cycle three specifically. So if you're interested in hundreds of potential new threshold crossing event TCE planet signals, you should come and track me down and ask me about that. Or if you have any inputs on the upcoming project I'm working on, which is going to be uh, studying the atmosphere of a super Neptune with JDUB cycle one observations. If anyone has any input on how I can do the data reduction with NIRIS SAUCE, I'm still trying to figure that out. I would love some input. So please come find me, thanks. Hello, everybody. I'm Sean McClote from the University of North Dakota. We have a small exoplanet research program there. It's it's one person. It's me. Um, I have very supportive advisors, and I work with Heiss Mulders right now, who's in Santiago, Chile. I'm here to tell you about my dissertation research modeling, building a model of planet formation by pebble accretion. The first part of my research explores the outcomes of uh, planetary growth by varying the stellar mass, the initial planetesimal distribution, the seeds, and uh, playing with the snow line. And one of the basic outcomes is shown here on the bottom right, where on the left are planets growing around different stars 
uh, without a snow line. And then on the right, with a snow line, planets interior simply do not grow as well. Oops. Um, I'm combining two models, one called Pebble Predictor uh, or PP, and one model from Ormel and Liu uh, accretion recipes, PP and OL combined to make the people's model, which is what I am building. Preliminary results are interesting. If you grow hundreds of planetesimals at the same time, you can actually promote growth of planets inside the snow line. And if you um, have certain conditions, you can actually get a late delivery of volatiles to inner planets around GK and M stars. If you want to know more about how that mechanism works, about pebble accretion, come find me at the UND Green poster. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Luke Parker from the University of Oxford in the UK. And my poster is talking about high resolution spectroscopy, specifically in the M band. So this is between about four to five microns. Um, and we're really interested in this because METIS, one of the first light instruments for the European Extremely Large Telescope, will be observing in this wavelength region and has the potential to study some very exciting science cases, for example, looking at lava world atmospheres or biosignatures on our nearest rocky worlds. The problem is, however, that hi these high resolution spectroscopy methods have only been tested uh, up to about 3.5 microns. So this is uncharted territory and there's real problems with thermal emission and telluric contamination. So to test this, we uh, observe Beta Pictoris B, uh, which is a very bright directly imaged planet. And we look in the M band with Cryos Plus. And we find that in this challenging atmospheric regime, we can still detect molecular signals. Here is carbon monoxide, which shows up about signal noise of about six. And if you want to learn more about the chemistry, the dynamics, or maybe how you can use the M-band in high resolution for your own observations, uh, please come to talk to me at my poster or drop me a message on Slack. Thank you very much. So hello, everyone. My poster talks about two stops. One part is orbital decay. The very first exoplanet that was proven to experience orbital decay is WASP-12b. And there are other few exoplanets that might experience decay in their orbit. Following that, I'm investigating on WASP-19b. For one to confirm whether the planet is experiencing orbital decay or not, they should have a bunch of data. So that's what I've done here with a bunch of data. I've shown you the result of linear ephemeris. So I have this bunch of data. What else can I do with that apart from orbital study? That's This is where I'm at. Uh, introducing my second part, which is transmission photometry and spectroscopy. I've done the atmospheric study on WASP-19b and modeled using petit ratrons. And um, the fun part is WASP-19a is a very, very active star. So uh, they have higher probability of having stellar contaminations like star spots, and it's very fun to work with. So is my study contaminated by star spots? No, not mine. I'm 99% sure of it. So to know how I've done it, please come find me. I'm Anita Raj. I'll be around here. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, everyone. I'm Jorge. I am a rising third year at Arizona State University. And I want to invite you all to come check out my poster on studying abundance ratios of ultra cool brown dwarfs. Now, why am I talking about brown dwarf atmospheres at an exoplanet uh, workshop? Well, that's because brown dwarfs are awesome. Uh, specifically, Specifically, while we know that uh, brown dwarfs, uh, well, brown dwarfs are theorized to form similar to stars, uh, they share temperature ranges and overlap in atmospheric processes to exoplanets. So they make a really cool object to study as an intermediary between stars and planets. Now, on the abundance ratio side, uh, we saw a little earlier this week how uh, planets are theorized to have superstellar carbon oxygen ratios as compared to their host stars. Uh, but in the uh, star case, stellar binaries are predicted uh, to have similar abundance ratios due to their similar formation environment. Uh, my work extends this to ultra cool brown dwarfs, uh, specifically late T dwarfs, and I want to study the abundance ratios between them in order to test formation theories. Are they forming more similar to planet and star uh, systems or stellar binary systems? So if you wanna find out the answer, come check out my poster, thanks. Hi, my name is Harsh, and I'm a rising senior at Springstead High School. Hi, my name is Shruti Subramanian, and I'm about to be a freshman undergrad at Purdue University. So uh, we've been looking through data in the NASA Exoplanet Archive to try to see the extent of discrepancies in the data that's been reported for a set of 11 different parameters. And 
To do that, we basically use that formula on the top left, taking the standard deviation of the nominal values over the average of all the error values. And on that side, you could see a quick example for 55C and CE. And then we take the log of all of those ratio values just to make it a little easier to work with. And then the graphs you're going to see on the next slide are made using these uh, log values. And we have more graphs if you really like graphs, but they did not fit into our slide. <laughs> So using that data, we basically create the histograms, one basically showing an overestimation and one saying uh, underestimation. And when we combine all the histograms, we found that our data was very overestimated, meaning that the given uncertainties, the range was really high than it's supposed to be. So showing that the data was overestimated and that this data was come from that's an Excel panel archive, that really speaks something. Because that overestimation, it means there's an error in the instrument or anything. Um, please come by, see our poster, and see our other fun histograms. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Xiaomi Tsai, UC Riverside. Um, so as we heard in Hannah's talk, this morning, we have detected uh, sulfur dioxide SO2 in this hot Saturn uh, exo exoplanet was 39b. Uh, what it means is for the very first time, we have the observational uh, evidence of photochemistry in play in the atmosphere of this exoplanet. But there's uh, all the theoretical uh, interpretation so far mainly relies uh, by 1D models. Um, so this begs the question, what's the distribution um, across the planet? Is it uniform? And um, what's, what, what's the implication for the night sites where there's no stellar light? So we've applied a 2D photochemical model representing the equatorial region, including the zonal flow and the vertical transport from the GCM. And we found that SO2 can accumulate to high up levels on the permanent night side where there's no stellar UV radiation available. Um, so I welcome you to come to my poster to find out more and discuss if there's any uh, observational implications. My poster is right at the right back of the poster hall. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Jake Turner. I'm a, a postdoc at Cornell University. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about magnetic fields. Not a lot of people have talked about that so far. Uh, so why do we care about magnetic fields? So if you get a magnetic field measurement, you can learn about the interior structure. We learned a lot about the radius mass diagram. This actually helps break that diagram. Uh, atmospheric scape, uh, you, if anybody cares about atmospheres, that's really important to know the magnetic field. Uh, dynamics, we think actually the magnetic fields change the dynamics of atmospheres, at least the ultra hot ones, as well as habitability. Uh, there's a lot of other things, star planet interactions that some people will talk about tomorrow. The best way we think we can discover magnetic fields of exoplanets is actually with uh, auroral radio observations. And so I show here a theory plot showing that there are planets that are above sensitivity curves of currently known uh, uh, radio telescopes. So we're, we're going after those, those objects. And so we think we had a a possible detection a few years ago of Tau Bu B, this big hot Jupiter planet, uh, one of the first uh, hot Jupiters discovered, uh, and we have a nice 8.6 sigma detection when we compare our on beams and our off beams, which we were really excited about. So we can actually get a constraint on the magnetic field of the planet that way, uh, which is actually consistent with their predictions and very similar to Jupiter. Um, and so in my poster, we're talking about a big follow-up campaign that we've been doing for the past two years using many different telescopes here all across the world, LOFAR in the Netherlands, uh, NANUFAR in France, LWA in New Mexico, UTR2 in Ukraine. Using multiple telescopes at the same time is very difficult, so I am out of time. Uh, so please come to my poster, and I will explain to you all about what we found or did not find. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Eyup Onlu. I'm from University of Florida and my poster is about retrieving poster distributions using machine learning. So in this project, we had seven different parameters, planet radius, planet temperature, and five different chemical mixing ratios. The data set we used was the data set for the Aerial Data Challenge 2023. This data is, uh, data is simulated for aerial mission only. 
and it had over 6,000 planet retrievals. So let me solve some key points, mm, right? So we use physics heavily in the future engineering part. So, you know, there was at least some physics in the project. Uh, we parameterize our distributions, then we use deep neural networks in order to predict those parameters. And I will say we did a good job. We were just, uh, at least the second place in the data challenge. So if you're interested about hearing about our model or chit chat about, chit -chat about machine learning, I'll be next to my poster. Thank you. Hello, I'm Sarah and I'm a researcher at uh, AER outside of Boston and Mass. And I would love to talk to you about analyzing Earth-like transmission spectra. So as we've been hearing about all week, upcoming missions will allow us to view Earth-like exoplanets in ways that we've never been able to before, which will be very helpful in searching for signs of life. However, there's so many open questions and challenges in trying to understand what signs of life on exoplanet spectra might actually look like. And this motivates a need for a way to make the most of what little information we might be able to get. So we've developed a method using information theory to try to do this. We've started with a bank of simulated Earth-like transmission spectra. And we compare the Shannon entropy of our model of an Earth-like transmission spectrum in different contexts, so around different host stars or through different ages in their evolution, to a potentially, whoops, that's not mine, to a potentially observed uh, exoplanet. And what we found is this, uh, this method allows us to quantitatively measure the Earth-like uh, the Earth-likeness of different exoplanets. So we can say one, uh, one exoplanet is more Earth-like than the other precisely. And it's very sensitive to the shape of uh, absorption features, which is fantastic if you're trying to identify biosignatures. So I would love to convince you that this method is easy and efficient. Uh, and if you're interested, please come talk to me in my poster. Thank you. Hi, I'm Malavika Vashish. I'm from the University of Liège, Belgium. So uh, my poster is on neural posterior estimation for exoplanet uh, characterization. Uh, and neural posterior estimation is a retrieval algorithm that comes under the umbrella of simulation-based inference. So the idea is that we don't have a likelihood function. So what we do instead is we have a neural network, uh, a neural posterior estimate, uh, estimator that estimates the posterior directly. And it trains on the joint distribution of the model parameters and the corresponding models. And uh, so that is during the training phase, you need several models and it takes a bit of time. But once trained, it is amortized, which means that you can have any observation and you can find its corresponding posteriors. And um, yeah, so I'm currently working on applying this to a high risk case. Uh, the poster is on uh, medium resolution. And so if you're working on high res, um, retrievals, uh, I would be very interested to talk to you. Um, and yeah, also a uh, side note, if any of you have a universal power adapter I, and I can borrow it, <laughs> please let me know. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, hi everyone, my name is Will Walks. I'm a grad student about to get my PhD at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, and I have good news and bad news. The good news is that there is lots and lots of work ahead of us before we are done characterizing planetary atmospheres. The bad news is that this is primarily because of our lack of understanding of stars and stellar heterogeneities. Um, so if you have had the misfortune of coming to my poster already, I probably didn't let you go. Uh, please find me if you wanna talk about this stuff, but be warned, I have lots and lots and lots of thoughts. Uh, thank you. Hey everyone, my name is Thomas Winterhalder. I'm a first year PhD student at the European Southern Observatory in Munich. Um, yeah, why should you check out my poster? Well, here I present a new method of combining Gaia and gravity data. Gravity is a near infrared uh, interferometer at the VLT in Paranal. So this journey starts with Gaia. We use Gaia DA3 to come up with precise predictions as to the companion position around its host star. Then we follow up with gravity, ideally make a detection, and then using some lovely Bayesian inference, we combine the two data sets 
And what that looks like, a short preview is to be seen on the right-hand side. The black is the Gaia-only orbit, the green, the Gaia plus gravity orbit. And you might say this is only a very slight modification, but when we look into the actual posteriors, you can see the constraining power of this method, especially in terms of dynamical masses, since these are degenerate in the Gaia data, but just one gravity observation, one gravity detection nails them down to a very precise estimate. And this is the point where we can actually do some atmospheric uh, science and we can use these estimates to evaluate different atmospheric models and to judge how valid they are in different mass regimes. So if you're interested in this and if you wanna know um, where we're heading with this, then yeah, check it out and we can chat over a cup of tea or coffee. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Mike Wong. I'm a NASA Sagan Fellow at uh, Carnegie Institution for Science. I'm one of the people helping tweet about this meeting. And when I'm not on social media, I like thinking about atmospheric chemistry. So atmospheric chemistry can be displayed as a graph in network form where the different nodes or circles that you see here are different chemical species in these different planetary atmospheres, Titan, Venus, early Earth, and modern Earth are displayed. The links between these nodes are chemical reactions. And you can see just by staring at these that they're all very different. They have different topologies different geometries, and you can use tools from network science and data science and graph theory to describe how quantitatively these are different or similar to each other. One of those is the network homogeneity, which you see here. And what you can see in this bar graph is that Earth's network is substantially different from other planetary networks in our solar system and somewhat similar to these biological networks shown in green. We have a metabolic network, so inside of a cell, proteins interacting with each other, a neural network, neurons inside of an organism, and even a marine food web network. And so this result is one hint that maybe something universal about biology is the way that it reorganizes flows of matter and energy and information in a functional way. So our first paper on this idea was published just a few months ago. You can uh, read about it using this QR code. You can also come to my poster and chat about it. And I just want to acknowledge all these wonderful colleagues at the Carnegie Institution for Science that really helped along with this. It was a very interdisciplinary project. Anirudh and Jason are geoinformaticians and Shauna and Bob are astrobiologists and mineralogists. So I'll hand it off to the next person now. Thank you. Hello, this is Chow. I just finished my undergrad in Shanghai and will start my PhD at the University of Chicago this year. So here I want to present our transmission spectrum on HD 209458B, which is called the OG in the field by my supervisor. Um, so we detected very large water feature and the comparatively smaller carbon dioxide feature, which could probably uh, explain the very low CDO ratio given by our model. What's more, uh, the higher resolution observation on this uh, target, uh, which is mentioned by Professor Mathieu uh, in his talk this morning, um, detected methane in its atmosphere, but our JWC result shows uh, our answer is that if you want to know, please come to check my poster. Um, and I am a uh, helper for session one and session two. If you have uh, questions on uh, running notebooks, please uh, reach out. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Sam Yi. I will hopefully defend my PhD in, in a month. Uh, and yeah, so over the past two years, we've been conducting a large survey to assemble a complete magnitude limited sample of hot Jupiter's orbiting FGK stars. So that study is almost complete and it comprises about half of hot Jupiter's previously known from the ground based transit surveys, and about half of them are new detections from tests. Uh, so if you're interested in some of the demographic results that come from our survey that are not on this slide, uh, please come to my poster or if you're just interested in how you can use this sample to construct or select new targets for uh, more detailed characterization, I'm also happy to chat. Thank you.